Well, Joe, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Why don't we start with your background? You know, where you came from, uh, maybe your time in Congress and what you've been done, doing since. Sure, yeah. I grew up in California and uh, after some initial early jobs, I took a job on Capitol Hill. Uh, I thought I'd do it just for a year or two and ended up working uh, 12 years as a staffer in the US Senate. Um, fascinating time, got to work on all kinds of legislation, mainly work for the Judiciary Committee, but all kinds of interesting, thing come, interesting things come through there. And my last several years, I spent working on a big uh, patent bill that finally got enacted in 2011, the uh, America and Vensac. Uh, after that, I went over and joined the uh, uh, patent office itself, work on implementing the act and litigating over it. Um, in uh, 2017 to 18, did a stint as acting director of the agency. Um, the whole system of acting directors and heads and this and that is a little chaotic. Um, you know, it always comes during a transition when, you know, you know, things are moving and uh, um, often happens kind of abruptly. In my case, the previous director quit unexpectedly and I got a call from the new political saying, oh, we have a nominee in the works, but he's not, do you want to be acting tomorrow? And you know, <laughs> so that, that was about it. And I, I think that's pretty, uh, pretty typical. And anyways, uh, after uh, that uh, fun adventure, I uh, joined uh, uh, Haynes and Boone, a law firm with a big intellectual property practice. I'm in their patent trials group here in Washington D.C., working on you know, a lot of the a uh, uh, lot of the same issues. Great. And so your your time in the Senate, can you tell us more about where you started there and where you wound ended up? Is it all committee work? Did you do any personal office work? You know, I started in, the, in a personal office. You have to often kind of get an entry level job, either um, a non committee job or a, um, or a more junior job in a senator's office and then kind of work your way up. A lot of senators who are looking to hire someone only want someone with so called Hill experience. Uh, personally, I think that's a little overrated. You know, you really want good lawyers, but you can see how the process and the rules are intimidating and people feel like I need someone who's already been here, you know, for a while. And, um, but anyway, after about a year or two of that, I migrated over to work for a Senator, um, John Kyle of Arizona to staff him on the Judiciary Committee. And he's the main member I worked for. I was also part of the team that went to uh, staff Jeff Sessions of Alabama when he briefly served as the Republican ranking on the committee in 2009 and 10. He needed to staff up and handle other issues as ranking. You're, responsible to, uh, for everything. But uh, and it was uh, for those two members that I uh, worked on um, the patent legislation that finally got done in 2011. And so tell me about the time on the, as a, in a personal office versus on a committee, you know, what was the allocation of your time and your responsibilities? Was it totally different or was it sort of the same since you were still doing legislative work? Uh, it's, you know, it's, um, it's much different, you know, the, um, in a personal office, you're spread much more thin. And often you're staffing a member for issues for which he or she is not on the committee. So you actually don't have much say in it. Uh, things came out of the committee, and you weren't on the committee, you know, didn't have a role in it. And you're kind of advising the member on how to vote on something on the, the floor and just keeping up with all the different bills coming out is you know, is a bit of a challenge in the meetings, et cetera. When you're on a committee, you're focused and you just work on those committee's issues and you see the bills from the beginning, you know, as they move through the committee process. So you have, uh, in the committee, there's much more of an opportunity to, um, um, you know, really get involved in the details of things and frankly, to have an impact. When I've talked to friends about going to work on Capitol Hill, I've often advised them, especially in the house, you really just want to work for the chairman or the leadership if you can, but you know, the big decisions are, are made in the committees. It's a little broader in the Senate, um, but in both places, the, the most substantive uh, legislative work is done in the committees. And so did you primarily work on a single bill or did you work on a range of all the bills that came through the committee? And what was your role with those? Everything that came through the committee, <laughs> uh, Senator Kyle in uh, particular, uh, only kept uh, two Judiciary Committee staffers. And so one or the other of us was always handling every bill that came through. So I you know, worked on, you know, there were two Congresses when we mainly worked on asbestos reform le legislation. In the years after 9-11, um, uh, national security legislation was you know, a huge focus of the committee. Um, you know, that actually dominated for quite a while. I worked on a lot of criminal legislation. 
And then just, you know, various odd things come up in the Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction. I, I, I long ago lost track of how many different titles of the U.S. Code I've, you know, drafted amendments or, uh, or legislation for. But uh, especially when the Democrats took control of the Senate after the 06 elections, you know, they were tired of the national security stuff. That's not their agenda. No more Patriot Acts or anything. And they shifted the focus to IP legislation. And, um, you know, you, the committee does what the, you know, where the chairman wants to lead. And uh, that's when a lot of us, uh, you know, started to focus on IP rather than uh, national security. So you didn't come in with an IP focus to begin with? No, uh, you know, you really, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes good to have a focus coming onto the committees, but um, even if you work for a subcommittee, often you have to handle such a variety of issues. Um, it, it's good to have, you know, some background in an issue that's critical to your member. Um, I used to do a lot of federal Indian law issues, which were of interest to Senator Kyle. That was part of the reason he hired me. But, um, you know, what I found is you just need to be a good lawyer because so many different things come up. Um, in some ways, uh, you know, I think some, uh, sometimes the best uh, background for these types of jobs, especially in the Judiciary Committee, is being an appellate lawyer, because you're used to just jumping into different issues all the time and you know, learning some new area of law. And that's really what you need to be you know, an effective staffer. The staff are really responsible for the details and you know, the research. And uh, you know, sometimes when I'd work on a bill, for example, in an area, um, you know, you not, not, don't just look up the uh, underlying statute, but I'd go through the annotations in the, in the code or in Westlaw just to see, are there any kind of traps here? Is there, is, are any of these terms, have they been given an unusual construction or, you know, what's the main case law here? Because the type of language you put into a bill, you know, if you're aware of those little, you know, pitfalls and traps, you can, um, you're much more likely to, uh, you know, get the member the result they want um, if you're aware of those things. So anyway, I found the skills that really match best are um, doing appellate law and having that kind of experience of jumping into different areas, uh, you, know, you know, pretty frequently. And so after that, you went to the executive branch. What was, how did that, how did that match up with your experience over on the Hill? Uh, it was interesting. Um, you know, I just, I spent a dozen years on the Hill and uh, frankly, getting the patent bill over the finish line was exhausting and I just needed a change. And wanted to go back to a more conventional uh, legal practice and uh, you know, going to the agency that uh, had a lot of changes made by the new law seemed like an interesting opportunity to um, not only help implement the new law, but to litigate over its uh, provisions. And uh, so I went and joined the solicitor's office uh, at the patent office. And uh, you know, suddenly like I have this job where I'm assigned this case and it's this, you know, it's a fixed record. You, know, you only litigate about what's in that record. And I've given plenty of time to do everything. There's no overnighters. There's no arbitrary political deadlines. It was a, it was a refreshing change. I, uh, I really enjoyed those years, especially after the, uh, you know, after my time on the Hill. And then you wound up going into private practice. So how's that that final evolution been? And uh, w when you look back at your time in Congress versus the executive branch, how do you see it now from the outside? Um. You know, private practice is also, frankly, a refreshing change. It's it's just good to do different things and challenge yourself uh, different ways. Um, private practice is also, you know, it's just it's simpler in the sense that you have clients and you're trying to figure out ways to advance their interests. And, you know, the things you learned in your past jobs are surprisingly, you know, helpful uh, in different ways. Um, I'm surprised how much my uh, Capitol Hill background is still relevant uh, to so many issues because I'm not doing, you know, lobbying, but um, they're still just, you know, just w whatever is happening on the Hill is always important. And, um, you know, it's something that, uh, that people are thinking about. And, uh, you know, you don't just need lobbyists for the Hill. You need uh, people who know the process or can put together legislation, uh, things like that, or advocate for, um, you know, positions, especially in a kind of complicated and yet controversial issue like uh, IP. Um, you know, it's, I'm struck by how much need there is for um, you know, lawyering in this area. So looking back to the Congress side of things, let's, let's talk a little bit about structure in, in the Senate. Um, you know, do you have any kind of high level thoughts about the, the structure of the Senate, um, how it's working internally, and then also how it works with the House since you've been there for such a nice stretch of time? Yeah, you know, I saw a lot of bills get done or sometimes crash and burn. And, uh, 
you know, went through a lot of cycles. You know, you, you see a bill get done the first time and then a reauthorization. And then when there's a second reauthorization, that's when you start to feel like you've been there a little too long. But there are certain dynamics you notice that, um, you know, aren't exactly out of schoolhouse rock or in your, uh, in your high school textbook. But, but um, you know, what, the main thing that, that really struck me, um, and I was always a Senate staffer, but I worked heavily with the, the House on legislation, you know, has to get through both bodies to become law. And you know the the defining uh, features of, of the two bodies are just that the House is so much bigger, 435 members versus 100, and they're up for um, re-election every two years versus six years in the Senate. Just the numbers alone force um, quite a bit more kind of uh, tempted to call it crowd control, but just you know means of imposing order in the House. So the committee structure tends to be much more rigid, and members are much more directed into their areas. Um, so, um, you know, and, and part of that is, for example, like if you're a, you know, you're a member, you know, you're a member of your party and you don't like what the leadership is, uh, you know, you're, you disapprove of a bill that your party is moving on the house floor. Well, when there's 435 of you, typically they have a pretty good margin either way. And, you know, truth be told, it's pretty rare that any individual house members vote is going to matter. So, if you object to the bill your leadership is moving, yeah, you can vote against it. Then they'll be mad at you, and you know you're not going to stop it anyway. Um, so you're really much more constrained that way. That's why you typically see people just voting with their parties, unless it's some hot political issue, you know, that's going to get them in trouble in the district. But that's pretty rare. And you know, even on the committees, you see the same dynamic in the House. The chairman usually has a generous margin of a couple of members. And again, if you don't like his bill, you can vote against it because, but you're just going to get him mad and good luck getting your priorities to move. Um, so, you know, the House members are really limited to what they can do in their committees and with their chairman, and the power tends to be heavily concentrated in the chairman themselves. Um, the Senate is much more of a free for all system where an individual senator can kind of, you know, be as powerful as he or she wants to be. A part of that is that. Um, um, you know, there's just not the same sense of order and rules and rigidity imposed in the Senate. Uh, part of that is the right to unlimited debate. Um, a lot of uh, things you know, for legislation to move, a lot of things have to be agreed to that have unlimited debate. That means any member can object to ending debate. And that means you have to deal with that member. So if there's a bill going through and a member says, I refuse to limit debate on this, um, well, you know, there's a, there's a process of closure for cutting off that debate. but um, bottom line is that eats up about a day and a half of floor time. Well, there's, you know, 52 weeks in a year. How many of them is the Senate in order? What are the other priorities? What are the members? And realistically, unless it's a huge priority of the administration or the leadership or something, if one senator puts, you know, objects to a bill's moving, refuses to terminate debate, you pretty much have to deal with that senator. Um, and it really creates opportunities for senators to get involved in much more things. Um, and, uh, you know, the process in general is just a lot more fluid between the two bodies. For example, like, you know, the bill when a house goes to the floor, um, you actually first go to the rules committee and the rules committee propounds a rule that dictates how long will this be on the floor, how much debate time will there be, and what amendments are in order. And once that rule is propounded, that's it. You know, nothing else is going to come up. Um, in the Senate, as you've probably seen watching uh, C-SPAN, it's a free-for-all. You know, senators, there's no rule. The bill just comes up. And when the, you know, when the, unless there was a UC agreed to ahead of time, um, you know, anyone can raise any amendment they want to. And amendments are literally, you know, offered, you know, drafted after the bill came to the floor and, you know, offered on the floor and negotiated on the floor. Um, I've definitely seen situations where, you know, the final compromise is literally worked out among you know, members, you know, right there on the Senate floor. Um, I've told people on two occasions, I've uh, uh, been in situations where uh, I, I'm assigned to draft the final language that's agreed to, and I draft it on the Senate floor. And by that, I don't mean, you know, we were all on the Senate floor. I mean, I look around for somewhere to write down the language and all the benches are taken and I get down on my hands and knees and write in the final text, you know, on the Senate floor. But you know, a, a level of chaos that's just unthinkable um, in the House, but it's a function of there only being 100 senators and that system is, is tolerable. And then of course, the other big difference is just senators typically representing much bigger areas. You of course have the small states that where the congressmen and senators are the same. And then only being up that after six years and that really um, channels how much um, 
you know, how, res how immediately responsive they are to popular opinion. Um, a House member, you know, if he's really ticked people off, you know, there's an election coming definitely within two years and, you know, he could be made to pay for it. A senator can take heat and maybe people are really upset now, but if he or she isn't up for five years, you know, passions will cool. And then just, you know, the typical senator just represents a much wider area. Um, and, you know, uh, an issue that illustrates, um, you know, this difference was, for example, there were a lot of fights over immigration and comprehensive immigration reform while I was on the Hill, never worked on the issue myself, but it's an issue where it's almost not as much of a left-right issue as a uh, populist versus populist versus the elites issue. Uh, you know, even in the Democratic Party, you got a lot of constituencies that are, you know, loyal Democrats, but more immigration restrictionist. On the Republican side, you get you know, the more elite Republicans who, you know, like having you know, inexpensive gardeners and you know, staff at restaurants and things like that. So you, you tend to get this elites versus the uh, masses divide. And you really see that in the way the House and Senate respond to legislation. And you know, a House member, if his constituents don't like something, you know, he's liable to run into them when he's at the grocery store or doing some small event. You know, he represents half a million people. A senator, you know, often when they come to a town in their state, you know, they don't meet with um, you know ordinary people. They meet with the head of the chamber of commerce or this association or business group, and their interaction with the public is much more filtered. And you really saw that in the immigration debates. The uh, Senate was much more willing to do some kind of big compromise that. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, would have extended some form of amnesty to you know people who were here illegally. In the House, you got much more of that populist reaction. You know, someone, the House member who had been yelled at at the grocery store and was worried about the next election cycle, was you know much keener to um, you know to uh, kind of appease this or respond to this populist sentiment. It's a real difference in how the two. Uh, th so those are the kind of main. Uh, um, differences in the character of the two bodies. And it really has an impact on certain legislation. The Senate does have this germaneness concept though. And I'm curious, that's a kind of rule, right? That, that it imposes on itself um, in, in a little bit, uh, you know, the same way or even more restrictive in a way than the House. What do you think about this germaneness concept? Yeah, you know, germaneness does limit what you can offer. So you know, germaneness basically means relevance. And, you know, when you're doing a, a patent bill on the Senate floor, people can't issue, you know, offer an amendment on defense issues, for example. Um, you know, it has to be relevant to the legislation that's there, but oh, that's still a pretty broad range. And, you know, if there's anything you don't like in that patent bill, you can offer an amendment to strike it or rewrite it or, or whatever. Whereas again, you know, an individual House member, you know, well, you don't like this part of the, the patent bill when it comes up, well, you know, is your amendment in order under the rule? Oh, the rules committee <laughs> didn't accommodate you on that. And as you can imagine, the rules committee works closely with the leadership and with, um, you know, the chairman on what rules are in order. They have to appease certain, you know, constituencies that really want something. If a lot of members really want, you know, an issue, then the whole rule can be defeated if they don't allow a vote on that. But if it's just one person, you know, and the leadership likes the bill, the chairman doesn't want to deal with that issue. You know, you're just not guaranteed a vote on your amendment, you know, no matter how germane it is in the House of Representatives. So what about that, that institution of the Senate, everybody likes to talk about the filibuster, uh, and maybe just more generally speaking, dilatory tactics, uh, and this extreme minority kind of right. What is your opinion on that after being in, in, involved in it for so long? Yeah, I'm unequivocally of the view that the filibuster is a good thing. Um, we need the break on legislation. Um, two reasons for it. One, there's just a lot of bad ideas out there um, that some member is willing to take a hold of and move as a bill and is superficially popular. And, you know, it's portrayed in the press like, oh, everything's filibustered, et cetera. It's actually really hard to get an individual senator engaged on an issue that's important and willing to block something. And often bad legislation does move through just because, um, you know, no one was willing to engage other than the two chairmen in the two bodies. And, and, you know, chairmen sometimes get talked into bad stuff or things for superficial reasons. You know, I uh, <clears throat> live in suburban Bethesda and worked at the PTO, worked with a lot of people who are, uh, you know, very blue area, you know, and, and especially whenever Democrats have a majority of the Senate and the presidency, there's always a lot of railing from, uh, you know, my friends and neighbors about the filibuster, how terrible it is. It tends to become sacrosanct when Republicans have all the power, but 
you know, when I've explained, one of the examples I've given to people of when, you know, why the filibuster is a good thing is, for example, when I worked for Senator Sessions when he was ranking, you know, he was, I handled civil issues for him. That wasn't really his passion. He was interested in crime and immigration, but he still, you know, he was ranking. He took that responsibility seriously and, uh, you know, would take meetings with me when issues came up. And there was a bill that actually moved through another committee, but that should have been in our jurisdiction that dealt with antitrust law. And usually antitrust legislation doesn't move, but suddenly I'm getting a request for a meeting with the uh, top Obama political and uh, top career person at the antitrust division and wondering what this is about. And another committee had started moving a bill that would have uh, opened up the Hart Scott Dino process for fast merger reviews and wanted to um, give the information that companies provide in the Hart Scott Rodino process to GAO, um, which basically makes it accessible to all of Congress. And you know, Hart Scott Rodino is this accelerated process for re reviewing mergers. And as these antitrust people explained to me, the reason it works is people know, well, you know, their, their information is compartmentalized and it, ne it will never leak, it has never leaked. Even within the antitrust division, you don't get access to it. And they say, you know, to do these merger reviews, you really need people's most sensitive information. And it's often not from the parties to the merger, but to third parties. What's your estimation of the market? Um, you know, where you think it's going, the value of your competitors. And they basically said, like, look, you know, if you if you open up this information to all of Congress, to, you know, any member can get it from GAO. People won't provide this information and you'll destroy the Hart Scott Rodino process. And um, you know, I, uh, you know, kind of synthesized all that, gave the presentation to Senator Sessions and just kind of looked at me and uh, said, yeah, Joe, why don't you put a hold on uh, that there bill? And, you know, we raised an objection. You know, the leadership certainly wasn't going to give this floor time and no one else engaged on it. You know, if no other, um, you know, the Democrats, you know, didn't in the Judiciary Committee for reasons of their own, didn't want to pick this fight. And if you didn't have the filibuster, this ability of one member to block something, you know, bills like that would become law um, because so few people are, you know, are paying attention. It's hard even to get that one senator to raise that objection. You know, the, the senator whose bill you hold then, you know, comes and complains, et cetera. So it's, it's not a, it's, you know, it's not something done uh, lightly. And the other point I'll just make, and this one should be obvious, is if you didn't have the filibuster, you just needed 51 votes, then Every time you have a wave election and one party takes the presidency in both houses of Congress, uh, often the first order of business, you know, if, if you didn't have something like the filibuster, where suddenly all power is concentrated in that new energized majority, the first order of business could just be to repeal everything that happened under the previous administration and was signed into law. Um, and you know, it's just good to have a little stability in the legal system. When a big new law is passed, I've definitely seen this with the patent laws, it takes a while for lawyers and the courts and the whole legal system to absorb it and figure it out. And, um, you know, you, you just need a period of calm uh, when a law has been uh, adopted. And, you know, under our current system, you really do have to get quite a bit of, you know, basically, you know, bipartisan compromise or some buy-in from the other side to get a major law passed. That's not just spending legislation, you know, that can be done on 51 votes. And, you um, you know, the, you know the, uh, to undo that or to modify it, you need that same kind of level of compromise or consensus. It ensures a lot more legal stability in the American system than you'd have. But if a brand new, you know, 51 vote majority were energized and just ready to undo, you know, whatever the bad old guys did that they just defeated, uh, you'd get a lot more of that. And uh, I really think it would be bad for the, um, you know, American legal system. How about the committee system? Let's talk more about that. Uh, obviously, you worked in committees, um, and a very important one at that. They're all important, but uh, you know, tell me about this way that the you know the, the Congress organizes and does this kind of parallel processing of bills in committees. And you know, there's some talk about that weakening, particularly in the House, as its power has been centralized. But you know, tell me about your opinion on the committee workings and how they did work, and how you think they could be improved. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a part of Congress that really does re reflect how the uh, schoolhouse rock video represents it. Um, things really do kind of get resolved in committee. In the House, um, you know, that's almost effectively by rule because, again, members have no real ability to get involved in matters where they're not on the committee or, or not in leadership. Um, your vote on the House floor doesn't count. You, you know, you can't offer amendments, etc. In the Senate, you know, any senator can block any bill he wants to, whether he's on the committee or not, get involved in anything. And you occasionally see members who come in 
and are hyperactive like that and get involved in all kinds of things, even when they're not on committee. But that tends to get tiring and worn down. And in the end, like ah, if you're really interested in that issue, join the committee. And uh, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in effect that um, uh, you know, the committees do become the area of expertise and uh, of the members who are most interested in that issue because to be effective, uh, you, you, know, you wanna be there when the deal is cut at the beginning. If you really care about a, a bill, for example, it's a lot easier to influence that bill if you were there when the bill was first being developed and voted on than to deal with it on the, on the Senate floor. If it's really objectionable, your hope on the Senate floor is really probably just to, um, to kill it. But people are, you know, the, the deals are initially worked out by the members who are interested in committees because people migrate there because they're interested. And once they come with that uh, proposal to the floor, especially if it has bipartisan compromise, um, it's hard for a member who you know, wasn't on the committee um, to get heavily involved. You know, we already worked out our deal. Yeah, we know you don't like this. Offer your amendment and we'll vote it down and, you know, and stop bothering us. And, you know, you see that dynamic enough, you realize, well, I just have to be part of the committee in the first place. And that does help, you know, develop this group of members who really have expertise in the issue as well. Um, you really see this in the House. Uh, because House members are so limited and where they can, they can be effective, they end up really learning the subject matter in their committees. And you'll see these House hearings where, you know, these members have been doing this for Congress after Congress, and you know they know that subject matter backwards and forwards, and can act really can ask really incisive questions. You know, with a lot of follow up. Um, in the Senate, you know, the senators are always tempted to have their fingers in multiple pies and get spread out a little more. Plus, they do nominations as well, which you know eat up a lot of the body's uh, energy. And uh, sometimes the senators aren't quite as in the weeds, and they you know rely a bit more on staff to. Um, you know, to get to the, you know, the details of legislation.